This is the current federal tax developments for the week of December 30, 23rd, 2019. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. To put it mildly, it was a very busy end of the week in the area of taxes this week. We had a couple of big things happen. During the week, we kind of knew all along we were looking at the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act, and we believed all week that it was going to be passed and would become signed into law, but the actual signing into law did not take place until late Friday. But that particular bill has lots of brand new things come up in the tax law. And we also had the release late in the week of the final regulations for the Qualified Opportunity Zones. Now, problem is, I've only got a half hour this week to talk about something, and the reality is that both of those demand, actually, if you really want to be honest, far more than a half hour to talk about. So this week, we are going to take a look at the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act. We're not going to take a look seriously at the, uh, the Opportunity Zone regulations. Now, a couple of big things in there, though. One really huge thing, if you're not aware of it, in the proposed regs came out earlier this year, the IRS had indicated that 1231 gains, you had to wait till the end of the year to start the 180-day period to reinvest. The final regulations will allow us to go ahead and use the date you started with it, plus consider all gains regardless of whether they're offset by losses during the year. So that's probably the good news there. Otherwise, there's 500 plus pages there. I have not gone through them in any detail at this point. So I'm just going to leave them for your reading for now. If your client is trying to get an opportunity zone before the end of the year to get the full benefit of the 15% step up before the seven years run and we got to pay you know whatever tax is left to be paid, uh, you really need to be reading that. You probably shouldn't be listening to this right now. You should be reading that at this moment because if your client's waiting to make a decision and you need to know what the answers are to those things, you probably need to check the regs right now. But let's talk this week about what Congress did. This is the by far the largest tax bill Congress passed this year, and honestly, only the second one of any consequence that Congress passed this year. And it deals with a lot of issues. But before that, I want to remind you that we are going to, we're still doing these broadcasts with Cal CPA. And we have an online state society rebroadcast of assisting the survivors of the decedent's estate. It will come up at 6 a.m. Pacific time and 8 a.m. Pacific time on December 30th. You can sign up for it on your State Society website if your State Society is participating with Cal CPA. Otherwise, you can sign up with it on the Cal CPA website. This particular session was taped before Congress had actually agreed upon the uh, issues that would be dealt with in the uh, appropriations bill. That means we deal with the SECURE Act in this particular session as if it is a proposed bill, not a final. But realistically, nothing changed that we talk about in there. So basically, you can treat it just like it's final. Nothing else has changed significantly. That would change our answer, except that we really do have the SECURE Act, and it really is you know, going to change everything about distributions uh, for inherited IRAs if the person survives into 2020. But you can sign up for that. Like I said, your state society, sign up there. Because if you sign up there, quite often you'll qualify for discounts. Otherwise, you can get it on the Cal CPA website itself. Let's talk about this bill now. And I've spent the start of this weekend finishing up the manual on this. Now, the good news for me of this particular bill, the Further Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020, signed into law on December the 20th, is that the SECURE Act part of it, which is probably the biggest part, was that the biggest part, at least it's tax related, uh, really didn't change from what the House passed this summer. And I had already written up a manual on that at the time, assuming that if it got passed, we would do sessions on it. So I had at least that much done. However, there are a ton of extenders that you need to be worried about as well. The SECURE Act, it's basically what we had this summer. We'll talk about it. But if you went through when the SECURE Act passed the House this summer and looked at those provisions, we essentially have all those provisions with no changes. So what the House passed is what's in this bill. We also have extenders, uh, disaster relief, and parking lot tax relief. The parking lot tax relief is going to be only part of the parking lot tax. It will not fix the parking lot tax for for-profit enterprises, but it will remove it from unrelated business income for not-for-profit, so that'll be big. Again, the extenders, Many of those are retroactive. That's going to cause some amended returns, at least if your client wants to benefit from the extender uh, for anything that happened in 2018. 
And finally, a separate provision I'm really going to cover here in its entirety is that we, we removed a series of taxes that had been enacted as part of the Affordable Care Act. Now, these taxes that are involved in this case, the Affordable Care Act taxes, were actually never actually became part of the law. I mean, they never actually, I should say, they never actually became enforced and weren't collected. So what we have here is we have repealed the Cadillac tax. Remember, we pushed that back once. My betting was when it was first passed, there was no way it was ever going to become law. You don't make something effective that far in the future unless you're figuring that, yeah, it's being done for budget purposes, and yeah, we're really going to kill it off at some point. They have killed it off at this point. We also got rid of the medical device excise tax and the annual fee on health care providers. So all three of those are gone, no longer part of the Affordable Care Act. They've been repealed. And that's pretty much all you need to know about those. That part of this bill is pretty easy. So let's talk about what Congress did. And I think we want to start with the SECURE Act. Reminder, the SECURE Act was passed by the U.S. House uh, back, as I recall, it was in May or June. It was early in summer. And Congress, and I should say, as I say here, this is a quick summary of the bill. We're only going to touch on highlights. And we talk about the extenders being retroactive. Let's talk about the SECURE Act provisions, right? This is Division O of this bill. Now, if you go to the Current Federal Tax Development's website, you actually can download this bill. Uh, you know, we've got the link there. We've got a short article on it. And we have the link to the full bill. The full bill, as printed in that tiny print that the Congress likes to use for final versions of pills, or no, bills, not pills, uh, goes for about 770 pages. Uh, the original print that you might have seen during the week when it came out of the House Rules Committee, that went on for about 1,800 pages when you considered the two parts, the amendment and the original bill. Now, the good news is only a portion of that bill really relates to the tax issues. So you do have to get in and find yourself into the right section. That's part of the reason why I'm telling you the divisions where these things are hiding. So we have that. Now, the SECURE Act divides into a number of sections. Let's start with what they call administrative provisions. One of the key issues that we're going to have here, which is nice, is right now, if I want to adopt for 2019 a profit sharing plan, I don't have to fund that plan in my business. And I'm going to say I'm a calendar year sponsor. I have to fund that plan until the due date of my return, including extensions. But I have to have actually adopted that plan, have signed all of the documents to adopt the plan before December 31st of 2019. If I don't do that, the plan's not in effect. The only type of retirement program that we can adopt after the end of the year as an employer is a simplified employee pension. What this new law will do is it will apply the SEP rule to all qualified plans. So I could go ahead and set up a new comparability profit sharing plan uh, basically for year 2020, I could set that up all the way through the extended due date of my 2020 tax return. Yes, it's going to be 2020 because it only takes effect for plans next year. So it's not going to help you late adopt a 2019 plan for your client, but it will help you in 2020. So I want to do a new comparability plan. If I want to do a defined benefit plan, uh, basically I have well, for a defined benefit plan, because that's a pension plan, really you've only got until September 15th, even if you are a sole proprietor or a C-Corp, because those are subject to the minimum funding rules, which means we really have to have that thing funded by the 15th day of the ninth month. And if you don't, you get penalized. But a profit sharing plan or anything that's not considered to be a pension plan, uh, those can go for the extra month. So we'll have those days. But again, that's for next year. This year, it's still going to just be a SEP that's going to have in play. But this opens up a nice thing for next year that allows us to do it. Now, please remember, this will not help you if you're looking to do a 401k structure because you still got to defer from the 401k during the year in which you're supposed to have deferred. You, you can't defer a year, you know, like nine months later. You can't do a deferral from the paycheck. So, yeah, it's going to basically be helpful for straight profit sharing plans, you know, which and by and that can even be a profit sharing plan with a, you know, where we talk about having the fancy allocations. But it's got to be completely employer contribution driven. It cannot be anything from deferrals because we can't go back in history and defer if we hadn't gotten the plan adopted during the prior year. But it gives us some moving room. So that's kind of nice. 
Other things they do, Congress is really into this, and this was something the Department of Labor had proposed. But now, defined contribution plans going to have to give their going to have to give participants, which is going to drive some people batty here, uh, an estimate of their lifetime income stream based on the balance in their account. This law has a number of provisions that, to be straight up, encourages plans to offer lifetime annuities, and this is part of that. Telling people, you know, here's what kind of annuity that you could get. We could pay you out, given your number, we can actually pay you out an annuity that is based on this number. Okay? So the idea is you would get that lifetime annuity. Now, this has been somewhat controversial because, you know, some people are not terribly thrilled about annuities as an investment procedure, but Congress seems to think that having some sort of sure amount of money per month is going to help people plan for retirement as opposed to having it in other vehicles. So in any event, nothing forces you to use the annuity, but we are going to be forced to tell everybody about what annuities would give them. There also is a special protection for plan administrators, for fiduciaries, for selections of a lifetime income provider. Uh, as long as fiduciary meets following requirements, they engage in objective, thorough, and analytical, analytical search purpose, identifying insurers in which to purchase contracts. And with respect to each insurer, they identify as potential. They consider the financial capacity of the insurer to satisfy obligations under guaranteed income contracts and consider the cost, including fees, and commissions of the guaranteed retirement contracts offered by the insurer in relation to the benefits and product features of the contract, administrative services to be provided on a contract, and on the basis of that consideration, they conclude that at the time of the selection, the insurer is financially capable of satisfying its obligations. That's probably a key point. And B, the relatively cost of selected guaranteed retirement income contract is reasonable. That's obviously going to require plans to document what they did in these selections. So that'll be the key. But we're going to, pr we're going to almost certainly want to uh, make sure we fall under those requirements. So we have that particular background. Okay. Some other things, and again, I'm not going over every issue in here, so we're going to have other issues in the plan. Let's go to the next big section, which is considered the Expanding and Preserving Retirement Savings title of the section. This has a number of provisions that's meant to encourage the use of multiple employer plan provisions. Congress believes that the cost of running a retirement plan has discouraged many small employers from having one. We also have problems though if we try to get together as a group and have a retirement plan. We have some major issues, including what was previously called the one bad apple problem. If you had one misbehaving employer, that could put the whole plan at risk. So Congress has now put together some fixes in this area. The key one is, yes, they are going to make it simpler and not going to make it as much of a problem to have the one bad apple. We're going to remove the one bad apple rule, replace it with other deals. We're going to establish a new category multi-employer multi, multi plan. I'll get that out right. Called the pool plan. Right. So I have a pool plan provider. This is meant to encourage people to adopt in there. The IRS will come up with model pool plan provider language. And there's a number of conforming amendments made to ERISA to get this in. Again, conceptually, the theory is that it will be cheaper for a small employer to offer their employees a retirement plan because we're going to have this one multi-employer plan which will file a single 5500 and will therefore and will be administered and will get a what should be presumably economies of scale from how offering this one big plan now of course you give up some flexibility when you do that but the concept is here they wouldn't have offered a plan anyway so this is probably better than any other thing that would be out there so it'll be interesting to see what develops in the market based on these plans and also what employers do about them. We've also made a change here uh, on this plan, section, Act Section 102. We are going to modify the rules for employers who want to set up their 401k programs to have what's essentially an automatic opt-in. You know, Congress started a few years ago saying, well, we're going to allow employers or the basic background was that we started allowing employers to opt in to, to have a forced opt-in uh essentially right for a safe heart for the automatic enrollment safe harbor after the first plan year congress was worried initially though that we set that automatic opt-in number too high that people would opt out but what they've discovered is the tyranny of the default 
And so Congress had said that A, it had to start a certain level, a low level, and that it could go no higher than 10% in later years. Now what Congress is saying, even with the first year, you can make it 10%. So we can have an automatic opt-in. New employee comes in, signs up, you hire him, and you just give him a document that says, unless you opt out, you know, we're going to take 10% of your salary, move it to the 401k. Uh, they said, yeah, we're okay with that. And the number can rise in later years to max out at 15%. Again, nobody has to defer, but what Congress realized is, as I said, the term called the tyranny of the default. If something is a default provision, people tend to go along with it. And what they've discovered from these automatic opt-ins is there's not really been much employee pushback. Employees just accept the fact that they're going to have this money taken out. Never having seen it, they never miss it. Okay, for all it's worth. So your plan can go ahead and up that amount. Congress obviously wants us to go ahead and do that. We have also simplified issues. If you want to take your Safe Harbor 401k plan and you want to go to across-the-board contributions instead of matching contributions, there used to be a lot of warnings and issues you had to give for that if you're going to go across the board. Congress has decided overall that across-the-board contributions are probably better for employees, and we don't want to make it so difficult that employers never consider going there. So we've greatly simplified that rule as well. So if you want to make the conversion, now again, all of these things don't start until next year. So you can't do it for 19 plan years. You've got to do it for 20 plan years. That's going to be your takeaway. Uh, also, we're given a whole bunch of, we're going to increase the amount of credits for a small employer plan startup. Going to increase that particular uh, percentage that would be allowed for Congress to do to increase the credit. So we're going to increase that now. The new credit now is lesser of 50% of startup costs or the greater of $500 or the lesser of $250 multiplied by the number of nine non-highly compensated employees eligible in the plan or $5,000. Okay, so basically you're going to get 50% of your startup cost or you know, this secondary limit if it's lower. So you could never get above 5000 but you could get up to that. And again, 5000 you have to incur 10000 of cost, you know, and essentially have at least enough non-highly compensated employees to get yourself above the, so be at least 20 non-highly compensated employees to get you to the 5000 limit. So in any event, and you'll always qualify for at least the $500 maximum. So it's something. And there'll be a separate small employer automatically automatic enrollment credit, right? So if you automatically enroll your employees in your plan, right, you get $500 a year per year for up to three years for startup costs for a new 401k plan or simple IRA plan includes automatic enrollment and up to $500 per year for three years if an eligible employer converts an existing plan to automatic enrollment plan. And again, these are also related to your costs that are incurred in making those modifications. So again, neat little issue. Congress also now has said certain non-taxable tuitions and stipend payments are going to be considered compensation for IRA accounts. So you can fund them even though they're not taxable. You can use those as a basis for funding your IRA accounts. We are going to repeal the maximum age for contributing to an IRA. Again, effective in 2020, uh, there'll no longer be a requirement that you can't be over 70 and a half to contribute to a, a regular IRA. Uh, we're going to, in fact, be able to contribute to the regular IRA as long as you have earned income. If you're 98, you can still make your contribution. Now, one quirky part of this rule, though, is that it does require you uh, to reduce your contribution, which is interesting. Uh, if you're trying to make a qualified uh, offset, a qualified contribution offset, you have to reduce that qualified contribution offset uh, qualified contribution deduction by the amount of contribution you're taking. The theory is we're not going to just let you run the contribution into the IRA and then run it straight out, never having sat there, but run straight through. So if you decide to contribute $4,000 to the IRA, then we're going to automatically reduce your qualified charitable contributions uh, by that 4000 so you're not going to be allowed to. The first 4000 of qualified charitable contributions coming out of the IRA will not be excluded from income. And again, that, that's simply to, pro to prohibit you from simply washing this through the system. Okay. Uh, new rules are going to require prohibited or portability of lifetime income options. So you can carry those from one plan to another. 
That'll be new rules for the plans to deal with. Uh, you're also going to have to, this is a little bit different, if you have long-time part-time employees. How's that? That for a little weird term. So if you have a long-term part-time employees, then you have to allow them to participate in 401k. A long-term part-time employee is somebody who has been had more than 500 hours but less than 1,000 for at least three prior years. That person who's a part-timer and generally has been excluded from participating in 401k will now be allowed in. But there are some special quirks to this. First, this person will not count for ACP and ADP testing. So in essence, they're not going to hurt you by being another non-highly non -highly compensated employee in that testing. You will not have to include them in your matches. You just have to let them in the plan. Okay? And you don't have to count any year, which is really kind of weird here. We get this input. We don't have to count a year. In this case, uh, the three consecutive years, we can ignore 12-month periods beginning before January 1st, 2021. So, in fact, the three-year period, it's not going to, you know, so the 19-year doesn't count. Anything from 19, 18, 17, 16 don't count. Right, 2020 won't count, uh, basically, and 2021 will be the first time the three-year period will count. So you could have 21, 22, 23. Okay, so 24 is the first time you're going to be forced to let these people in. However, the way the law is written, I can still let them in because I don't have to enforce that three-year rule, or I could look back to three years other than and not worry about this cutoff. So I could let them in earlier, but I'm not going to be forced to have this provision in my plan until 2024. So be aware of that particular rule. We're also going to allow penalty-free withdrawals from retirement plans for individuals in the case of birth of a child or adoption. That, that's, a kind of, that's a significant issue. So we're going to kind of work that for birth or adoption of a child. That part will be in this, in this bill. So that's interesting. Now remember, previously you might say, wait, birth of child, can't we exclude for medical? Yeah, but only if, over seven, only if you cleared the percentages. We don't have a percentage problem here. We also are going to kick the RMD age up to 72. So required distributions will not begin until a taxpayer attains age 72. They'll have to take out the first distribution by April 1st of the year following year, which they attain age 72. This provision, though, has a quirk. It only applies if you had not attained age 70 and a half by 2019. So if your client triggers their first required distribution this year, you know, in 2019, because they reached 70 and a half in 2019 and they're going to take that distribution by April 1st, they will still have to take a 20 distribution, even though it will not be 2072 yet. If your client, however, doesn't turn 70 and a half until January 3rd, then they're fine. They can wait till you turn 72. So again, this is not going to create a skip period. If your clients already attained 70 and a half, they're going to still have to take all their payments. They're not going to be able to delay one in the middle. You're going to have to take them all. If your client, however, has not attained 70 and a half by the end of the year, but would have attained 70 and a half in 2020, well, then we're going to wait. So this is going to create like a, nobody's going to, nobody's going to first trigger RMDs in 2020. It's basically how it's going to work. We're going to have to wait for those people to get to age 72 before we can first trigger the RMD. So quirky rule. Uh, but kind of understand why it's there. Other provisions, there's some revenue provisions. This is probably the biggest negative provision that people get worked up about. We will no longer be able to effectively have stretch IRAs any longer. Inherited IRAs, the required distribution rules are going to change dramatically for inherited IRAs beginning with this act. Under the law that's in force for somebody dying all the way through the end of this year, 2019, uh, we had two different sets of rules. One set of rule if the person had attained 70 and a half before they died, and another set of rules if they hadn't. If they hadn't attained 70 and a half, then we had a default five year distribution rule, which said you had to get all the money out of the IRA account by the end of the fifth year following year of death, or we could use the life expectancy of the designated beneficiary. Conversely, if they had attained age 70 and a half, the only option was the life expectancy of the designated beneficiary. In both cases, surviving spouses could still convert the plan over to an IRA in their own name. Now, that part's not changing. Surviving spouses will still be able to do the conversion. However, we're radically changing everything else I just mentioned. Bottom line, 
we are getting rid of this rule of what happens before we're 70 and a half and after, or now in this case, before we're 72 and after. We're just going to, everybody's going to be under the same distribution rule if when the IRA holder, they are 92 or they are 22, the same rule is going to apply. By default, the party receiving an inherited IRA will have to have the entire balance out of the IRA by the end of the 10th year following the year of death. So we're taking what was the five-year rule. We're going to double that time period to 10, but that's going to be the only rule we've got. The life expectancy rules are gone for most people. Now, the spouse can still, like I said, treat it as their own. So the spouse could treat it as his or her own account. State new beneficiaries get all that stuff we get currently, right? It's when things go to a non-spouse that we have this problem, right? There are some parties that can still use the lifetime distribution, and they're kind of interesting. And these are called eligible designated beneficiaries, or EDBs, under the um, law. Okay, so let's see. Who can still use their life expectancy? If the surviving spouse does not elect to treat the account as his or her own, then they can still use their life expectancy, even if they're like 30 years younger than the decedent. Doesn't matter how much younger they are, they can use it. So they will always have the right to use their life expectancy. Also, the minor child of the original holder of the IRA or beneficiary of the employer plan can use their life expectancy payout, but only until they reach the age of majority. Once they reach the age of majority, they have to go to a 10-year payout. Now, key issue there, grandchildren don't count, great-grandchildren don't count, nieces don't count, nephews don't count. Some kid that you just decided that, that you liked and you're going to add to your IRA, that person doesn't count either. Only your own natural or adopted child counts for this purpose. So it's somebody who would be considered you know, a natural or adopted child under the law is who's going to qualify for this. Now, we also have the issue that age of majority is not really defined in here Presumably, it's going to be the state's, individual state's age majority, which means that answer could be different in different states. And we'll probably get to some interesting question of what happens if the kid moves between the time they inherit the IRA and the time they finally, you know, reach age majority. What do we do about that? All kinds of neat things are going to wait for the IRS to look at that. Also, ones that can use their own life expectancy, a disabled individual. Now, that, de that definition is the one we use for determining if they can qualify for early distributions under Section 72M7. So that's the definition of disabled. Again, that person, their life expectancy. Again, and this person never switches over to the 10 years. It's just their life expectancy. Similarly, a chronically ill person, who, which comes under the rules we see there for the long-term care rules, right? For 7702BC2 is where you're going to find the definition. That particular person, that chronically ill person, is able to uh, take it over their life expectancy. Now, to be chronically ill, they need substantial assistance in basically uh, two activities of daily living, if I remember my terms there. That's the test we see for long-term care, and that talks about eating, toileting, transferring, bathing, dressing, and continence. If they need significant assistance in those areas, right, uh, could not perform the Apple activities of daily living, then, right, they're going to be considered to be the chronically ill individual who can do the spread out. Or if your beneficiary, the person inherits your IRA, does a beneficiary, is less than 10 years younger than you, then that person. So you leave it to your brother who's two years younger than you. Your brother can use his life expectancy regardless of what that life expectancy is. So, again, same sort of interesting background. So that's how that one works. Now, the interesting aside on that one is, note, it does not appear it's going to be any difference if we leave it to a trust. The trust will still get the 10-year provision. The trust will not need to worry about all the provisions we worry about now to have a trust be considered a conduit. And since those conduit provisions probably make no sense, aside from we need them to qualify to have used the stretch, all those trusts probably need to be looked at again. Now, remember, this does not apply to anybody who has died. Any account that was inherited from a decedent that died before the end of 2019. So anybody currently being paid out over stretch continues to be paid out over stretch. But if your client is alive, we enter 2020, then when they die, 
they cannot use a stretch to pay out the IRA. That's going to require a lot of additional tax planning. If you've been planning on a stretch IRA, if that's been part of your long-term tax and estate plan, you need to relook at everything. Also in the revenue provisions, uh, we have an increase in penalties for failing to timely file retirement plan uh, items. We're going to significantly jump the penalty for failure to file, essentially, a tax return, right? Failure to file these uh, tax return retirement programs. We're going to go for late filing of 5500 It's going to go from $25 a day to $105 a day. And the max penalty is going to go from 15000 to 50000 right? Uh, going to have other related penalties are also going to jump dramatically. So be aware that's how we're paying for this part of it. Okay. Other provisions. There's some general provisions in here as well. There's a, a for one year only, we're going to extend a special rule that allows limited reimbursement of monies to volunteer firemen, emergency medical responders. If you're in that area, you already know what it is. It is section 139 cap B. If you don't ever deal with that, doesn't really matter. But it's one that's been extended for one year. So we're stuck a little extender in there. We also expanded what 529 plan uh, amounts can be used for as qualified education expenses. Now, we did not expand it to include homeschooling. So that, that was the big fight. That's what stuck this thing in the summer. That was not added back. Rather, we're going to still we're going to be able to use our 529 plans uh, to pay for certain apprentices programs. Okay, fine. A fees related to that, but also up to ten thousand dollars lifetime per beneficiary of the plan of the five twenty nine plan can be used to pay their student loans. Now the other interesting aside is we also can use that amount out of that same five twenty nine plan to pay up to ten thousand dollars of their siblings' student loans. Okay, so everybody gets ten thousand out of a five twenty nine to go against student loans if they want to. Now, it may beg the question about why we have a student loan if we have a five, if we had 529 money. Why didn't we spend the money instead of borrowing? But, hey, I'm not going to beg that question. We're just going to tell you you got a one-time chance to pull this off. So it can go into the 529. Now, what will be interesting to see is how states that allow a deduction for this are going to react if somebody puts the money into the plan and then turns around and, like, a few days later uses it to pay a loan if they're qualified. That'll be kind of interesting to see what the states do about that one. We also have a major change to the kitty tax. You probably heard over the summer about what was called the Gold Star Family Problem. We did get a kind of fix going forward on that in another in other legislation this year, but it still wouldn't fix last year's problem. This now is going to fix it. Congress hadn't considered that in some cases, minor children are receiving significant payouts for annuities for deceased, for, you know, for children, let's say for parents who were killed in battle. That was a Gold Star issue in a combat zone or for parents who may have been first responders that were killed on the job. And those annuities were considered unearned income, tax at ordinary income rates that were being shoved way up now because we weren't comparing them to, let's say, the surviving spouse. Let, let's say dad died, you know, in combat zone. Now we got a single mother raising the kid. Single mother has relatively low income. But suddenly... And under the old law, we always compared the kids' income to mom's, and mom was paying tax at a low bracket, and the brackets are pretty wide down there. So, yeah, it didn't matter. Everything came out as if it was taxed to mom. It looked good. Now, suddenly, we're going into the trust brackets that get to the top rates very, very quickly. So things that were previously being taxed at 10% or 15% were suddenly being taxed at 37%. That produced a problem. Well, Congress hadn't thought that through. So what's going to happen now is we're now going to be pushed back for 19 and later years to using mom's, you know, tax rate rather or now the parent's tax rate instead of using the trust rates. That'll be a negative for some of your clients who are high income clients because the trust rates actually gave them some lower brackets to play with. But Congress just gave up on a fix and said, you know, we were trying to simplify this. We basically fouled up and hadn't considered all these issues. So now the kitty tax is there. If you had somebody who was negatively impacted by this in on their 2018 return, you can elect in 2018 to use either the, you know, the old law or the uh, TCJA trust-based law. And whichever one you, you know, and so that means since you didn't use TCJ, since you used TCJA trust-based law on the return, because that's the only option you had, if you want to go back and make the change and go the other way, you're going to have to amend the return. 
which seems an appropriate way to start into the other part of the bill. That is the Taxpayer Certainty and Disaster Relief Act 2019. This had extenders, disaster relief, and parking lot tax relief. <laughs> okay. And yeah, by the way, th th this week we're probably running long on this program. So yeah, get used to it. Again, I'm going to try to cut it down, but this is really going to be like a four-hour CPE program. We get it done. So it's like, yeah, we're trying to cut it down without leaving too many big things out. First thing is we have a ton of extenders. Many of these had left the law at the end of 17. That's going to cause you an issue because that means we have a whole lot of these that are going to have to require amended returns. For instance, if a taxpayer had cancellation of debt income and it was qualified home mortgage in or mortgage indebtedness, they weren't insolvent. They probably paid tax on that cancellation of debt in 2018. Now we retroactively restore the qualified home mortgage cancellation of debt rule. So you'd have to go back and amend the return for that. Also, this will affect a lot more. Remember those private mortgage insurance premiums for mortgages taken out 20, 2007 or later that we were able to consider as interest on the mortgage and we lost that for 18? Now it's retroactively back. Oh, by the way, and all of these disappear again after 2020. So we're going to be repeating this again very shortly. So keep keep your eye on that. The medical expense. Remember, we got 7.5% of AGI was our limit on medical expense for 2017 and 18. But then we have to go back to 10% for everybody in 19. That's going to go to 7.5. Good news, no amendments there. Uh, it's also going to go now again, be extended to that level, right? We're going to restore the deduction for qualified tuition expenses. So we've got a taxpayer who you know, could have qualified for deducting qualified tuition expenses, but, you know, but wasn't there last year. Now they're going to be able to go back and amend the return to take that. It will also apply for this year, right? The credit for non-business energy property is also retroactively restored for 18, for, nine, for 18 and 19 and 20. So that's another potential amended return. And then there's a ton of other industry-specific fixes in here, like the NASCAR fix for the property of life, you know, for property in NASCAR. So you're going to build yourself a NASCAR track. We can get seven years on that. Also, and that's not just NASCAR, but that's what everybody thinks of when we talk about it. Uh, Senator Grassley's bio, biofuel credits that have been pushing, the reason basically why he's chair of Senate Finance this year. He gave up Senate Judiciary to go to finance to get this through. He finally got it through. These ones we're not going to cover right now. I'm not going to list them. It take too long to list them. If you, though, have any of those specialized credits, take a look at the list of what's in there. Okay, there are ones that are there, ones that aren't. We also added some disaster tax relief. It's generally for disasters taking place in 2018 and 2019, slightly into 2020. What they basically did is they put in here and said for all disasters for those years, we're giving them the same breaks effectively that we gave uh, people for the hurricanes for earlier years. We're just give up. We're going to give the same breaks on the plan distributions, on the uh, credit for employers, for maintaining the employees. We're going to give them, you know, the whole bit about earned income. Uh, test for an income credit, all those special breaks that we've had before, we're going to restore. It'll be restored for 18, 19, and a few days into 2020. That's a weird part of the act. It's 30 days after date of enactment if there's a disaster, it'll count. It's like, it's weird. And some things are 60 days, so some things go a little further. Some are 180 days into the year, so this little bit weird about how you recover these benefits, but it's what we have. Finally, we're going to kill off for not-for-profits only, the parking lot tax. You may remember the parking lot tax. Those are expenses incurred for providing transportation benefits to your employees. If you were a for-profit enterprise, you don't get to deduct those expenses. Congress said, well, it's not fair not not-for-profits aren't going to be penalized because the employees still don't pay tax on this, right, up to the limits. So we're going to treat those as unrelated business income for tax exempts. This started the screaming about the parking lot tax that got Congress all worked up because suddenly small not-for-profits all over the country were having to file 990Ts to pay this parking lot tax for the cost of providing parking to their employees. And while the IRS put out a safe harbor that probably got rid of most churches, it wouldn't have gotten rid of a church if the church had reserved spaces, let's say, for the ministers. Because we still have to then treat the minister's reserve space as something we've got to deal with. So... Yeah, Congress finally decided we're just killing this for tax exempt. 
So it's only fixed for tax exempt. It will not be considered unrelated business income for a tax exempt entity. And that is retroactive to 2018. So it's going to be there. It's as if it was never in, as if it was never in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So again, your clients are going to have some amended returns to do if you manage to file and pay that. I have heard from a few people that they actually tried to pay the parking lot tax and IRS returned the 990T. So it's like some people may have never gotten it paid. So in any event, whatever it is, we get the money back or if it's never got accepted, well, apparently you're okay now retroactively. Uh, Congress fixed that up. Well, it is your last chance for CPE now. So, you know, we're here. We're here at the end of the year. I got a, I noticed on Twitter this week we had a lot of uh, a lot of people I know who are in the industry of giving, you know, live sessions who are making notes about coming back home from their last class. Luckily for me, I always finish out my last classes for sessions here in Arizona, in Phoenix. So my good news is I'm always kind of here on my last sessions. My last sessions on the road uh, were conducted the week before. In fact, that, that was the one in Connecticut that's going to be the uh, assisting survivors of the decedent's estate on, on December 30th rebroadcast. That was my final road trip. After that, I got to come home. So we have all of these issues going. But remember, check in. Most state societies have some offerings in January. We're going to keep having some of the, we're going to have these rebroadcasts going through January, even have some going into February on some issues. But this is a time to check and see what you've got. We're running out of time to get in. And by the way, if you've been delaying your tax update, now's the time to go grab it because, yeah, we do have the year in tax bill. So check your state societies, see what you've got here to grab your CPE and get up to speed. And as I said, we plan to be doing some four hour sessions on. Uh, this new bill. Uh, we're talking with a couple of state societies about doing this, so we'll see what we can do. We'll see if we can get at least some of this webcast. But again, this obviously all just officially came down on Friday, so we're still working this. So hopefully I'll be able to give you a little more information on the website during this week about what we'll have available. We're tentatively looking at a January 8th date uh, in Phoenix uh, for doing a session, which would be both live and webcast. Uh, so we may have that. I'm hoping to do at least one or two others that may be involved. So, but anyway, you know, stay tuned. We're going to hopefully have some stuff just on this new bill. This has been now, oh, and I do have other live and upcoming. I should mention December 8th when I mentioned I will be going to Oregon in Beaverton on January the 10th, doing a session on real estate partnerships. Get in, get out, get taxed. Uh, partnership taxation, real estate partnerships. We probably will touch on the opportunity zone issues there as well. So if you're going to be in Beaverton, uh, you can go ahead and pick up that day. This has been Kernfield Tax Developments for the week of December the 23rd. You can get regular updates on our website, kernfieldtaxdevelopments.com, and that is where I will post on the story about the new bill. Uh, if we do, you know, when and if we get some sessions in there. I'll try to post them there so you can follow them at that point. Uh, you can send any questions or comments to me, Ed Zollers at currentfulltaxdevelopments.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Ed Zollers. And I do follow discussions on Reddit in the tax pros session slash r slash tax pros. I also follow the tax talk discussion group of Cal CPA and follow, as I'm a member of three state societies that have connect groups, I do follow the connect groups for three state societies, Arizona, uh, Minnesota and New Jersey. So if you have some postings there and I think I can be helpful, I'll try and chime in there and see if we can help. This is going to be another interesting tax season. We have a brand new law, 500 page of Opportunity Zone regulations, and we're promised another 500 pages of 163J regulations all before we have to start trying to deal with our tax season. This is going to be another messy year. So we'll try to help you get through this and try to work through what's happening. So join us here next week on Current Federal Tax Development.